Here's the next 10 minute installment uh, about, that's what I'm aiming for, uh, from Smithsonian Magazine at uh, smithsonianmag.com. Um, the Dark Side of Thomas Jefferson from October 2012. And I just got home from work and I'm going to continue this lovely exercise with uh, something to wet my uh, palate, uh, Deschutes Brewery Inversion IPA. For decades, archaeologists have been scouring Mulberry Row. That's where the, sl the, the house slaves and more favored slaves and even some white workers would, would live and stay. Finding mundane artifacts that testify to the way that life was lived in the workshops and the cabins. They have found saw blades, a large drill bit, an axe hand, a uh, head rather, blacksmiths, pinchers, a wall bracket made in the joinery for a clock in the mansion, scissors, thimbles, locks, and a key, and finished nails, forged, cut, and hammered by nail boys. The archaeologists also found a bundle of raw nail rod, a lost measure of iron handed out to a nail boy one dawn. Why was this bundle found in the dirt, unworked, instead of forged, cut, and hammered the way the boss had told them? Once, a missing bundle of rod had started a fight in the nailery that got one boy's skull bashed in and another sold south to terrify the rest of the children. In terror were Jefferson's words, as if he were put out of the way by death. Perhaps this very bundle was the cause of the fight. He goes into that more later. Weaving slavery into a narrative about Thomas Jefferson usually presents a challenge to authors. But one writer managed to spin this vicious attack and terrible punishment of a nailery boy into a charming plantation tale. In a 1941 biography of Jefferson for young adults ages 12 to 6, the author wrote, In this beehive of industry, no discord or revilings found entrance. There were no signs of discontent on the black shining faces as they worked under the direction of their master. The women sang at their tasks, and the children old enough to work made nails leisurely, not too overworked for a prank now and then." End quote. See, this is the funny thing about, you guys know how uh, Cheney said they'd be throwing, uh, and Rumsfeld were like, they'll be throwing candy and flowers and welcoming us as liberators. In the old days, when that didn't turn out to be the case, the rulers still told the people, yeah, they welcomed us to candy and stuff. Okay, so you're suckers. It might seem unfair to mock the misconceptions and sappy prose of a simpler era, except that this book, The Way of an Eagle, and hundreds like it, shaped the attitudes of generations of readers about slavery and African Americans. Time Magazine chose it as one of the important books of 1941 in the children's literature category, and it gained a second life in America's libraries when it was reprinted in 1961 as Thomas Jefferson, Fighter for Freedom and Human Rights. That's why I'm at the Smithsonian Mag, boys and girls. In describing what Mulberry Row looked like, William Kelso, the archaeologist who excavated it in the early 1980s, writes, There can be little doubt that a relatively shabby Main Street stood there. Kelso notes that throughout Jefferson's tenure, it seems safe to conclude that the Spartan Mulberry Row buildings made a jarring impact on the Monticello landscaped. landscape. It seems puzzling that Jefferson placed Mulberry Row with its slave cabins and work buildings so close to the mansion, but we're projecting the present onto the past. Today, tourists can walk freely up and down the old slave quarter, but in Jefferson's time, guests didn't go there, nor could they see it from the mansion or the lawn. Only one visitor left a description of Mulberry Row, and she got a glimpse of it only because she was a close friend of Jefferson's, someone who could be counted upon to look at it with the right attitude. When she published her account in the Richmond Inquirer, she wrote that the cabins would appear, quote, poor and uncomfortable, end quote, only to people of, quote, northern feelings. The critical turning point in Jefferson's thinking may well have come in 1792. As Jefferson was counting up the agricultural profits and losses of, of his plantation in a letter to President Washington that year, 
It occurred to him that there was a phenomenon he had perceived at Monticello but never actually measured. He proceeded to calculate it in a barely legible scribbled note in the middle of a page and closed in brackets. What Jefferson set out clearly for the first time was that he was making a 4% profit every year on the birth of black children. The enslaved were yielding him a bonanza, a perpetual human dividend at compound interest. Jefferson wrote, I allow nothing for losses by death, but on the contrary shall presently take credit 4% per annum for their increase over and above keeping up their own numbers. His plantation was producing inexhaustible human assets. The percentage was predictable. I'd be happy for anybody to try to debunk any of this stuff. I did not take a long time looking for one. I just look for somebody that's like, well, that's good enough to go ahead and try to debunk. Good luck, you guys. Oh, page will load in 18 seconds. Time to sip a beer. Smithsonian.com is like um, when a technology every few pages, vision. they make you watch an Mr. ad Gold for a few seconds. It's that's fair. Fine. It's a good magazine. Advice. I've subscribed in the past, but I don't think I have a subscription right now. In another communication from the early 1790s, Jefferson takes the 4% formula further and quite bluntly advances the notion that slavery presented an investment strategy for the future. He writes that an acquaintance who had suffered financial reverses, quote, should have been invested in Negroes, end quote. He advises that if the friend's family had any cash left, Quote, every farthing of it should be laid out in land and Negroes, which besides a present support bring a silent profit from 5 to 10 percent in this country by the increase of their value, end quote. That poor man having to invest in human flesh because it was so lucrative. Oh, I feel bad for him. The irony is that Jefferson sent his 4 percent formula to George Washington, who freed his slaves precisely because slavery had made human beings into money, like, quote, cattle in the market, and this disgusted him. Yet Jefferson was right prescient about the investment value of slaves, of what Unseen Perfidy might call a sound investment strategy. It was a successful uh, strategy. A startling statistic, emer except for that history now knows you're a jerk off. Okay, but other than that, success all over the place. Oh, yeah, and you're bankrupt when you die. Okay, other than that, success, successful business strategy. Yet Jefferson, <coughs> oh, excuse me, a startling statistic emerged in the 1970s when econ economic, econ okay, I'll go slower, when economists <laughs> Taking a hard-headed look at slavery found that on the eve of the Civil War, enslaved black people in the aggregate formed the second most valuable capital asset in the United States. David Breon Davis sums up their findings, quote, In 1860, the value of southern slaves was about three times the amount invested in manufacturing or railroads nationwide. The only asset more valuable than the black people was the land itself. The formula Jefferson had stumbled upon became the engine not only of Monticello, but of the entire slaveholding South and Northern industries. Shippers, banks, insurers, and investors who weighed risk against returns and bet on slavery. The words Jefferson used, their increase, became magic words. Jefferson's 4% theorem threatened the comforting notion that he had no real awareness of what he was doing. Hmm. Any of you apologists want to talk? He's just caught up in the times. Who knew it was just normal to him? Sure, there was abolitionists and he had friends of him and talked to him, but he never knew it was wrong. Well, he said it was wrong. He didn't, just caught up, couldn't help himself. Jefferson's 4% theorem threatens the comforting notion to those apologists that he had no real awareness of what he was doing, that he was, quote, stuck with, or, quote, trapped in slavery, an obsolete, unprofitable, burdensome legacy. The date of Jefferson's calculation aligns with the waning of his emancipationist fervor. Jefferson began to back away from anti-slavery just around the time he computed the silent profit of this, quote, unquote, peculiar institution. 
so I guess he was definitely one of the first Americans. And this world was crueler than we have been led to believe. A letter has recently, can you imagine? It was actually not so great living at Monticello. Gary might beg to differ. A letter has recently come to light describing how Monticello's young black boys, quote unquote, the small one, the small ones, age 10, 11, or 12, were whipped to get them to work in Jefferson's nail factory, whose profits paid the mansion's grocery bills, as well as other things. And he gets more specific, again, Smithsonian. This passage about children being lashed had been suppressed deliberately deleted, he goes into this in more detail in later pages too, from the published record in the 1953 edition of Jefferson's Farm Book containing 500 pages of plantation papers. That edition of the Farm Book still serves as a standard reference for research into the way Monticello worked. By 1789, Jefferson planned to shift away from growing tobacco at Monticello whose cultivation he described as a culture of infinite wretchedness. Tobacco wore out the soil so fast that new acreage constantly had to be cleared, engross, engrossing so much land that food could not be raised to feed the workers and requiring the farmers to purchase rations for the slaves. In a strangely modern twist, Jefferson had taken note of the measurable um, climate change in his region. The Chesapeake region was unmistakably cooling and becoming inhospitable to heat-loving tobacco that would soon, he thought, become the staple of South Carolina and Georgia. He visited farms and inspected equipment considering a new crop, wheat, and the exciting prospect had opened before him. Oh, that's a good stopping point. 